Okay, <clears throat> Theonomy, Westminster, and Libertarianism. I am Jonathan McIntosh, by the way, uh, uh, fellow of humanities at New St. Andrews College, where I teach political and economic philosophy, philosophical theology, ethics, um, Tolkien, that, that stuff. Okay, Theonomy, General Equity, or Westminster, and Libertarianism. In this paper, I want to consider three important political philosophical ideas that I think are each competing with each other for the attention of Reformed Christians today. These political ideas are first, theonomy, second, the historic Reformed rejection of theonomy, according to what is known as the principle of general equity, and third, libertarianism. My aim in considering these three ideas together is really twofold. First, I hope to provide some needed clarity to many of the discussions and debates Reformed Christians have had and are likely to continue to have regarding these ideas. Second, my hope is that in clarifying these ideas, I can provide a new perspective and helpful framework for how libertarianism in particular might be seen as relating to theonomy on the one hand and historic Reformed political theory on the other. My analysis in this presentation is not intended to be a deep or detailed scholarly examination of any of these topics, nor is it intended really to break any new ground philosophically. My aim, rather, is merely to initiate a conversation on these ideas amongst us as a Christian community, and hopefully to provide some guidance as to the direction this conversation can and possibly should take. We begin then with theonomy. As most of you will know, the word theonomy is composed of two Greek words, uh, the Greek words for God, theos, and nomos, law. Uh, contrary to a claim sometimes made, however, theonomy does not, therefore, mean God's law. To confuse the linguistic origins of a word with its meaning is to commit the etymological fallacy. Etymology does not determine meaning. Theonomy, rather, in the context of reform political thought, is the theory that the Mosaic civil or judicial code remains binding or obligatory for civil societies, and especially Christian civil societies today. Again, theonomy, in the context of reform political thought, is the theory that the Mosaic civil or judicial code remains binding or obligatory for civil societies today. Thus defined, we might say that the 13th century theologian St. Thomas Aquinas had what we mean here by theonomy in view when he asked this question, whether the judicial precepts of the old law bind forever, from his Summa Theologiae. Aquinas' answer, by the way, is no, they do not bind forever. Likewise, Calvin, John Calvin, who also rejected theonomy, nevertheless had what we mean by theonomy in mind when he speaks in his institutes of those, quote, who deny that any commonwealth is rightly framed which neglects the law of Moses and is ruled by the common law of nations, end quote. We'll be coming back to that statement later. As the examples of Aquinas and Calvin illustrate, the theory that the Mosaic judicial or civil precepts that they still apply today is not a new one. It's been around for a while. Nevertheless, the use of the word theonomy to refer to this theory is comparatively more recent and may be traced back to the Christian Reconstructionist movement of the 1960s and 70s. The Reformed philosopher and apologist Cornelius Van Til, although arguably not a theonomist in our sense of the term, nevertheless helped popularize the term when he famously wrote that, quote, there is no alternative but that of theonomy and autonomy. Okay, those are the options. There is no, um, uh, there is no alternative but that of theonomy and autonomy. Here, Van Til was probably using the word theonomy in its etymological sense to mean simply God's law. In the hands of Van Tilian writers such as R.J. Rushtuni, Gary North, and Greg Bonson, however, the term came to assume the much more specific definition we're uh, giving it here. Or we're not really giving it here, it's uh, just the way I think theonomy generally uh, is, is defined. Their unique fusion like right, figures like Rushduni, North, and Bonson, their unique fusion of the three strands of Van Til's presuppositionalism in, in epistemology and apologetics, and then post-millennial optimist triumphalism in eschatology, 
And then theonomy in politics and ethics, this um, rope of three, these three strands formed the core of Christian Reconstructionism, of mo a movement aiming at the complete reformation of the church and society according to God's word. Greg Bonson, for example, defined theonomy this way. Theonomy teaches that we should presume that Old Testament laws continually continue to be morally binding in the New Testament unless they are rescinded or modified by further revelation, end quote. Another aspect of theonomy stressed by Bonson, when I'll come back to again later, is what has become known as the regulative principle of the state. As Bonson again puts it, in addition to civil, rule, civil rulers being morally obligated to enforce those laws found in scripture, theonomy also teaches that civil rulers are morally obligated, quote, to refrain from coercion in areas where God has not prescribed their intervention, end quote. So theonomy, at least on Bonson's definition, involves not only a requirement that civil governments today enforce the Mosaic judicial precepts, but also a requirement that civil governments not legislate beyond the Mosaic judicial precepts either. This is theonomy's regulative principle of the state. Well, with this summary of theonomy in hand, let's turn now to what the historic reform view of theonomy has been. I already mentioned uh, Calvin's awareness of theonomy, right, you didn't call it that term, but his awareness of theonomy as a political, distinct political position uh, a moment ago. What I didn't mention was the rather caustic terms Calvin uses in discussing theonomy. He refers to it as a dangerous error, a perilous and seditious view, one that is held by men who are stupid and false. <laughs> Calvin affirms the traditional distinction between the ceremonial, judicial, and moral precepts of the Mosaic law. That's very classical. You find this in medieval thinkers like Aquinas, dividing up the Mosaic law into judicial precepts, ceremonial precepts, and moral precepts. Calvin accepts that, that division. And Calvin expressly rejects the view that the ceremonial and judici judicial precepts necessarily belong to the unchanging moral precepts. I didn't mention this, but theon a lot, many theonomists tend to question that division, especially the division between the moral and the judicial. There's a tendency to see the judicial as merely a species of the moral precepts amongst many theonomists. Um, but Calvin, at any rate, uh, uh, sees these as three sort of distinct um, uh, categories. Instead, Calvin says that, quote, each nation has been left at liberty to enact the laws with it, which it judges to be beneficial, end quote. Though he says any law which they do enact must be, quote, tested by the rule of charity so that while they vary in, in form, excuse me, they must proceed on the same principle of charity, end quote. Well, the Westminster Confession of Faith codified uh, the reform rejection of theonomy in somewhat less pejorative though no less definitive terms. In chapter 19, uh, on the law of God, the Westminster Confession similarly divides the Mosaic law into ceremonial, moral, and judicial precepts and says of the people of Israel that God gave them as a political body, judicial laws, quote, which expired together with the state of that people. Right, so the judicial laws expired together with the state of that people not obliging any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. Okay, so the judicial precepts do not oblige now further than the general equity of those precepts may require, end quote. So where theonomy then could be summarized as the view that Mosaic judicial precepts do apply today, except if and when scripture specifically says that they don't, I think the historic reform position could be, uh, and that represented by Westminster Confession, could be characterized this way. The Mosaic judicial precepts do not apply today, except where the principle of general equity says that they do. Okay, again, theonomy says they apply, unless they don't. Westminster, they don't apply, unless they do. <laughs> that's, that's how I'm representing these, th these differing views. Okay. Um, and it's for this reason, incidentally, that I think the expression general equity theonomy that is used by some 
moderate theonomous uh, is actually uh, confusing and misleading since the formula general equity, equity was used by the Westminster divines to distinguish the reform view from the one uh, that's most commonly understood by the term theonomy today. Well, this, however, brings us to the much discussed question of just what the Westminster theologians meant by the term general equity. Reformed writers have typically given two lines of response, um, at least as, as I was able to tell in, in, in researching this topic. Uh, reform writers typically give two lines of response to this question of what is general equity, which I think they see as broadly either the same response or compatible um, with, with each other. The first line of explanation says that the term general equity is a way of referring to the, just the natural law in general or to the moral precepts of the Mosaic law in particular, or even more specifically still to the Ten Commandments. Okay, so what, what did the Westminster divine say mean by general equity? It's just talking about gen, uh, natural law or, or maybe the Ten Commandments. On this interpretation of the general equity principle accordingly, what the Westminster Confession and other reform sources are saying is that the judicial precepts do not apply today, except insofar as they also happen to be unchanging moral precepts, or at least contain uh, un these unchanging moral precepts. Calvin, for example, reflects this perspective on the equity of the judicial precepts when he writes this in the Institutes, quote, It is a fact that the law of God, which we call the moral law, is nothing else than a testimony of natural law and of that conscience which God has engraved upon the minds of men. Consequently, the entire scheme of this equity of which we are now speaking has been prescribed in it, that is, in the natural law. All of equity is in the natural law. Hence, he says, this equity alone must be the goal and rule and limit of all laws. Okay, so general equity is what we're shooting for when we're trying to decide what are good civil laws. And then we use Old Testament judicial precepts just so far as they line up and conform to that standard of general equity. Calvin's successor in Geneva, Theodore Beza, similarly wrote this, quote, Although we do not hold to the forms of the Mosaic polity, yet when such judicial laws prescri prescribe equity in judgments, which is a part of the Decalogue, we, not being under obligation to them, insofar as they were prescribed by Moses to only one people, are nevertheless bound to observe them to the extent that they embrace that general equity, which should everywhere be in force. Because it follows natural equity and expounds that perpetual precept of the Decalogue, thou shalt not steal, to this, as an example, to this extent all are bound to fulfill them both, end quote. Okay, uh, before I move on to the second kind of line of interpretation, uh, here's a problem I see with this line of explanation of the general equity principle. As we've seen, that, that is just explaining it in terms of natural law or the Decalogue, moral precepts. As we've seen, Reformed thinkers already recognized the distinction between those mosaic precepts, which were judicial in character, and the, from those that were purely moral. The fact, therefore, that a judicial precept happens to contain an enduring moral precept wouldn't by itself explain why that judicial precept should therefore also be a judicial or civil precept today. Okay? Since there are many other moral precepts in the Mosaic Law that are also not a matter of civil law. Okay, so it, it just the, the explanation doesn't get us very far. If we're trying to if you find a judicial precept in the Old Covenant, and, and, and you look into it, and it contains a moral precept, that by itself wouldn't tell you whether it ought to be a civil law today, because there's lots of moral precepts in the Old Covenant that don't necessarily, uh, you know, like the commandment, the prohibition on covetousness, for example, okay. Well, fortunately, the second way in which the Reformed writers talk about the general equity principle, I think, is a little more helpful, and as we'll see uh, towards the end, even suggestive, I think. We begin by noting that the term equity means something like justice, fairness, or impartiality. And the qualifier general in general equity is meant to distinguish general equity, justice, impartiality, fairness, etc., from the idea of there being a particular equity, justice, fairness, or impartiality. Okay. What's general equity? It's not particular equity. Okay. The idea conveyed uh, by the expression 
the expression general equity, accordingly, is the idea that while each political society, each particular political society, typically has its own unique laws by which it strives to achieve justice and the common good, underlying varying laws from, that, that vary from society to society, there's also a body of laws underneath that virtually every political society shares in common. Now, the classical Roman terminology used to refer to these two bodies of law, right, those bodies of law that all nations have in common versus those bodies of law that are unique to a particular society, the Roman terminology is the jus gentium, or the law of nations, and the jus civile, or civil law, on the other. Thus, whereas a society's unique body of civil law represent a particular equity, the law of nations that virtually all political societies hold in common represents a form of general equity. It is this universal law of nations, accordingly, that the Westminster divines seem to have had in view when they spoke of the mosaic judicial precepts not applying except insofar as their general equity, that is to say, that which the judicial precepts have in common with the law of nations, they don't apply except insofar as the general equity requires. Calvin reflects this line of thinking in the passage we cited earlier in which he characterizes theonomists as those, quote, who deny. What do theonomists deny? They deny that any commonwealth is rightly framed which neglects the law of Moses and is ruled by the common law of nations. Okay. Beza similarly seems to have the use gentium or law of nations in mind when he says that we are bound to observe the judicial precepts today only to the extent that, quote, they have been ordained by nature upon the entire nation of men, end quote. Finally, the Westminster divine George Gillespie, he speaks of civil magistrates today being, quote, obliged to those things in judicial law which are unchangeable and common to all nations, but not to those things which are mutable or proper to the Jewish Republic, end quote. Thus, while it is not the case that Reformed writers always agreed with each other over which parts of the judicial precepts were part of the general equity, what they did have a broad consensus on was on the principle of, excuse me, the principle of equity itself. The general equity principle meant that the Mosaic judicial precepts did not apply unless they were, there were compelling moral reasons for believing that they applied. And more specifically, those moral reasons were informed by the law of nations accepted by virtually all political societies in all places and all times. Now, one development in the history of Reformed political theory that is, I think, particularly worth mentioning here, as it represents what I think might be classified as a significant change in understanding of the general equity principle. And that concerns the 1788 American revisions to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Although historically reformed writers rejected theonomy itself, they nevertheless affirmed, as Calvin, for example, did, that the civil magistrate had the duty of enforcing both tables of the law, right? So Westminster, Calvin, we reject theonomy. Nevertheless, um, they agreed that the civil magistrate had the duty of enforcing both tables of the law, that is, both those parts of the Decalogue concerning man's relationship to and worship of God and man's relationship to his fellow man, right? first table, second table. These Reformed writers believed this because they believed it was part of the general equity of the Mosaic law, that is, that it was something that all civil societies everywhere practiced, even if the worship that their laws regulated was, paradoxically, pagan worship. Calvin has this very fascinating discussion about how, um, you know, the pagan, the, they, they were wrong to force idolatry, but at least they were understood that you got to force religion, okay? Um, even though he also thinks if your government is trying to force idolatry, you're supposed to disobey them. Mm -hmm. So the one point on which Calvin thinks is the most important thing the civil magistrate does, even pagan, pagan societies, that's the one point that they should have disobeyed. Anyway, I, I think it's a conundrum in Calvin's thought, but anyway, moving on. Um, in 1787, however, at the same time that the Constitutional Convention was at work drafting a new constitution for the American states, and for a great lecture on which see 
George's uh, lecture, one of his lectures from the last um, Buchanan conference. Um, but at the same time that the Constitutional Convention was at work drafting a new constitution for the American states, one in which there would be no established religion and no infringement on the free exercise of religion, the Presbyterian Church in America was revising the Westminster Confession of Faith accordingly. The result was a version of the Westminster Confession of Faith that completely removed any references to the civil magistrate having duties concerning what we might call first table matters or religious matters. Lee Irons, uh, who I think is Orthodox Presbyterian Church uh, writer, he describes what was going on here in terms of, quote, the definiteness with which the American church, the American Presbyterian Church, wanted to express its rejection of the older theocratic views, not theonomic, the older theocratic views of the civil magistrate and its adoption of a fundamentally new understanding of the teaching of the word of God on this subject, end quote. Lee Irons goes on to say this, quote, the position held both by modern theonomists and by the original Westminster divines, viz. that the civil magistrate is obligated to enforce in the civil arena the Decalogue's prohibition of false worship, was formally, right, the, the position held by both these groups, was formally and intentionally repudiate, repudiated by the American Presbyterian Church. Uh, their, and their revisions to the Westminster Confession of Faith. In other words, end quote, okay. In other words, and as I'm suggesting here, by removing religious offenses from the jurisdiction of the civil magistrate, the American Presbyterian revisions to the Westminster Confession involved an intentional narrowing of the general equity principle. It is this American revised version of the Westminster Confession, moreover, that is today the official creed of the Presbyterian Church of America, PCA, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, OPC, and it is one of the accepted confessions for church membership within the communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches, the CREC. Well, we come now, finally, to libertarianism and how it might be seen to relate to these other Reformed ideas. While not of itself a uniquely Christian or Reformed political theory, libertarianism is nevertheless adhered to by many Christians in general and by many Reformed Christians in particular. Yet, like theonomy, libertarianism is a term requiring careful definition and distinction. Many uses and senses of the term libertarian are admittedly incompatible with Christian doctrine. The sense in which most self-described Christian libertarians use the term, however, as well as the sense it carries in many philosophical discussions of political theory, often have to do with some version of the non-aggression principle. Understood in the strict sense of the term, Libertarianism is nothing more nor less than the political philosophy according to which the only moral use of coercion is in response to a prior act of aggression. For the use of coercion to be justified, according to libertarianism, the coercee, um, the one being coerced, must first be guilty of some act of violence, theft, or fraud. And although libertarianism is often paired today with various forms of utilitarianism, hedonism, and individualism, as I argued in my paper at our January, our January conference, Christian libertarianism may be best understood as a particular and indeed as, I think, the most consistent political application of the classical natural law moral theory taught or adhered to by the Apostle Paul, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, John Calvin, um, C.S. Lewis, and so forth. Something else that Christian libertarianism holds in common with classical natural law theory is its recognition of the theologically and hence politically unique relationship that the ancient Israelites had with respect to God and hence with respect to each other and to the Gentile nations around them. It is precisely because our political societies today and their rulers have not been specially established and authorized by God that we must make use not only of biblical law, but also natural law to help determine when, in the absence of such special authorization, civil rulers are permitted to use coercive force. More specifically, I believe one fair way to understand libertarianism in classical natural law terms is, is, is to see it as an attempt to limit civil government's use of coercion primarily to those areas regulated by the law of nations. As was alluded to before, classical natural law theory, including that of the reformers, followed the ancient Romans in dividing human law into two major categories, the law of nations that virtually all political societies held in common, and a body of civil law that is unique to, to each political society. 
Although the Roman law of nations covered a wide range of topics, for later representative thinkers, such as Aquinas, the law of nations was primarily understood as prohibiting acts of violence, theft, violations of sales, agreements, and contracts, and other behaviors making human society to be impossible. In other words, the law of nations was a libertarian law of non-aggression. As libertarian scholar George Smith comments, many of the classical works on the law of nations, quote, provided the infrastructure for what would later become a libertarian theory of rights, end quote. If so, then viewed in historical and classical natural law terms, what libertarianism essentially amounts to is the view that all coercive human law ought, as much as possible, to be limited to the law of non-aggression encoded within the law of nations that virtually all political societies recognize. For the libertarian is when political societies venture beyond the clear boundaries historically marked out by the law of nations by creating coercive civil laws that are unique to their own special circumstances that those political societies become guilty of using coercion in ways that are unjustified. This brings us in conclusion to how we might understand libertarianism as relating to theonomy and to the historic reform principle of general equity. As we've seen, for the mainstream reform tradition, the Mosaic judicial precepts do not apply to civil societies today except so far as their general equity requires. As we've also seen, what they meant by general equity is something like the law of nations. The judicial precepts apply to civil societies today only so far as they contain laws that God intended to be applied not just to the Israelites as a unique political community, but to all political communities without distinction. But as I've just suggested, the law of nations that God intends for all political communities to observe has historically been recognized as, by and large, a libertarian law of non-aggression. So pulling all of these various strands together then, what this means is that I think there's a case to be made on both historical and conceptual grounds for associating the general equity principle of the reformers with something like the libertarian principle of non-aggression. This is not to say that this is what the reformers themselves expressly had in view when they spoke of the general equity of the Mosaic law. This is because beyond vague references to the moral law or to the law of nations, it's not clear that the reform writers had anything expressly in mind when they spoke of the general equity of the Mosaic law. There's certainly nothing that they entirely agreed on together. They all agreed general equity. Ask them what that is, <laughs> the debates begin. What I am saying, however, is that the reformers believe that only those laws in the Mosaic Code which are common to virtually every other suitably stable political community are in fact applicable to civil societies today, and that when we look at what, common, what that common or shared body of laws is, it is practically indistinguishable from those laws of non-aggression which libertarians would have all political societies enforce, enforce exclusively. In this respect, accordingly, Christian libertarianism might be viewed as a kind of hybrid between, on the one hand, the reformers' natural law and specifically law of nations general equity hermeneutic, applying the judicial precepts of the Mosaic law, and on the other hand, the theonomous regulative principle of the state, according to which political societies today are not to legislate beyond those matters expressly permitted them by biblical law. In sum, Christian libertarianism is the general equity principle of classical reform natural law theory combined with the theonomies with the autonomy's regular principle of the state, suggesting that if there were such a thing as general equity theory, libertarianism would have, has, would have as good a claim to that title as any. For a proper defense of these claims, of course, a much more thorough analysis of the relevant text would be necessary. For the present, I've offered only a brief introduction to what is involved in the claims of theonomy, the historic reformed rejection of theonomy in favor of the general equity principle, and libertarianism an introduction that I hope may prove fruitful in helping to frame a discussion both in the Q&A to follow and into the future uh, on these important matters. Thank you.